content is really almost like an endless well. How do you define a content strategy? That's a great question. That's a great question. A content is, as you say, it's huge. I mean, obviously what we're producing now is content, right? And I'm sitting here surrounded by content. So everything is content, really. So you're, you're absolutely right. What is what is right? So what is too much? So um, ultimately, it comes back to that question of, of understanding um, your audience. You know, who, who are they? And what is it that their needs? What, what are their needs? Right? What, what are we trying to solve for here? So that's an important question. You, you have to then look at that within the context of um what's going to benefit us within our strategy so you know if we need to keep the social media presence out there we need to get a lot of engagement we need to produce a lot of content um and content in that sense can be reactive rather than proactive and i'll come back to that point in a moment um and then of course you need some content for your website for seo purposes and just for general good experience um and uh, and helping uh, your users you may need content for events right in which case some of which can be digital some of which will, some of which won't um, you might need content in the form of tools so tools that attract people to your website which might be a you know, who knows a mortgage calculator or an seo tool or whatever it might be something that your audience actually will benefit from using that that can be content um, as can your know, video content as you know here we are um, and podcasts and all, all of that right so there's a huge huge area so so what does your audience need and what do you need? So um, that's the ultimate question. Now, in, in building a content strategy, as I say, I look at um, a couple of things. So proactive versus reactive content is one thing I look at. Um, now, when I talk about proactive content, I, I'm talking about a, effectively a content calendar, which is something that's very common these days and, and in my mind, absolutely essential in any, any marketing department. If you haven't got a content calendar, you are going to miss things. You're going to get things wrong. Now, a content calendar isn't just a document that says this is when we're going to put some content out, right? That's fine. That's, that's just organizing yourself. Um, nothing special about that, but good thing to do, but nothing special about it. Um, what a content calendar really should be doing is looking ahead over the next three, six, 12 months and saying, what is going to happen? What do we know is going to happen that could in any way be relevant for us to talk about? And then we'll have our own campaigns that we talk about. We'll have our own messages, our own product launches, et cetera, that we want to push. But also we should be producing content on the back of what we know is happening in the future. Uh, so, for example, if there's a, a cricket World Cup or a football World Cup, um, you know, if there's uh, uh, the Oscars, right, if there's uh, you know, some uh, planned moon landing or something, right, I mean, what, whatever it can be, something that's, that's going to resonate with people. Um, you should capture that in your content calendar. This is going to happen on this date. And it could also include, of course, things like you know, Christmas and Ramadan. It, it could include um, uh, you know, National Dog Day or, or you know, whatever you like, right? Any event that's coming up it, it, that you can twist the story around. Now, in my experience, it's, it's most of the time, um, almost any business can find an angle on a story. Um, so it's doesn't mean you can just write about that story um you know i mean the, a good example is is um a yeah, piece of content that uh, that i did with um uh with fidelity uh, investments uh, years ago where the world cup was coming up now an investment company has no right to just produce a blog about the world cup and start talking about how football is great and who they support that's it's not relevant it's not relevant to their audience it doesn't make any sense um but if you can find an angle on it um which you know, we did we did uh, the world cup of economies and we said, if we look at the World Cup, if those countries' economies played each other, who would win and what, how would that work out? That's interesting, right? Because that not only plays on the fact that the World Cup is on and, and people are going to naturally engage in that sort of thing, but also our audience who are interested in economies and what's going on in the world will learn a little bit about each of those as we t do those stories and play it out over those, those few weeks. So really interesting piece of content. It doesn't naturally feel like a good fit, but you can find a way to make it fit. And that through having that content calendar and saying these are the events happening over this six months, you can say, let's do this sort of blog here. Let's put this into our podcast over here. Let's do a video for YouTube or for TikTok or whatever that, that just rides on the back of what's obviously going to be talked about in a month's time. So that gives you your proactive planning. Your reactive uh, uh, piece is more around process than around planning. Um, so it's not something you can plan for, but if something happens um, on uh, social media or an event in the world, you need to be on it. So you need to be monitoring trends. You need to be looking at what's happening, getting alerts, have a team that is able to very quickly respond and write a story about that, a team that's very good at writing very quickly. Um, and then you know, through that, you can you can jump on the back of something that is, is exploding 
very, very quickly. But if you don't monitor it, you don't have a process to very quickly react to it. And in the larger institutions, you need a process because you'll need someone to be able to sign it off. And if it's a one week sign off process, you're dead. So, you know, you've got to have a method of signing something off within a couple of hours. Uh, but if you can do that uh, within a larger organization, it's much easier in a startup, of course, um, then you know, it enables you to, to very quickly get it on the back of trends and start to, to steer them um, in, in a way that works for you. Um, so. That, yeah, that's one element of content. Um, you know, another element I talk about is the um, the content bubble, um, which is a model that's in in the book, um, which is that there's three at three areas to look at three different bubbles. Um, one is a is a small bubble bubble in the middle, which every company does, which is talking about yourself, talking about your company. We've just won this award. We've just hired this person. We've got our best results ever. Okay, great, good stuff to talk about. But the vast majority of people don't care, right? That's it, right? You love talking about it. Of course you do. No one else really cares, right? <laughs> so your investors might do, some of your customers might do, but let's be honest, most people don't. So the next level up again, which most companies do, is talking about things that are relevant in the industry. So you know, if we come back to financial services, it might be, you know, that it's it's the it's the tax year end, um, or you know, there's uh, it's the the budget or something like that is happening that's it's related to the industry that we're in. So we should have a perspective on it. Most people do that. Um, but the larger bubble, which is the one that where you can capture anyone's interest if you're smart around twisting that content, is the rest of the world, right? And that's where those other stories that we've just talked about come in. So write about yourself, write about your industry. Sure, that's important. But think about the wider world and what's going on and how you can find ways to, ways to, to create relevance, because that's how you're going to attract new people. That's how you're going to get something to go viral, which is a phrase that everyone in marketing hates. But you know, that's, that's something that everyone wants, right? So yeah, if we can create something to really take off, it needs to appeal to a broad range of people. So that's where that, that much larger bubble comes in. That's where those stories like World Cup, for example, um, come in. So there's a couple of ways of thinking about content. Uh, that's brilliant. Uh, everybody, I mean, you've convinced everybody that content is really critical. Yeah. Okay, good. So let, let me tackle both of those points. So like I say, firstly, I'm going to disagree with you on something. So yeah, you say content is expensive and good content is really expensive. I don't agree with that. H high production content is expensive, but that doesn't make it better than the low cost content. And you know, in reality, nowadays, if you've got if you've got an iPhone in your pocket, you can record great quality content, right? Because what is good quality content? Is it the fact that it looks really polished and you've got flying drones taking shots of Niagara Falls? No, it's not. That's not good. That's not necessarily it could be good content. But it's not necessarily good content. Good content is what solves the problem for the person who's reading it, right? Does it address what it needs to address? And you can do that in 60 seconds on a video that you record on your phone with a, a little green screen behind you or even in your own garden or whatever you want to do that actually just answers the problem. So actually, content can be produced very, very quickly en masse at high value. If you've done your planning right that we were just talking about, your proactive and your reactive thinking, if you've got that that planning, you can produce really, really good content very quickly and very, very cheaply. Um, now, having said that, like I say, there are some conditions where there are expensive things you need to do. Um, there are sometimes you might need to uh, to pay for some some production. You might need to buy some expensive film uh, equipment or, or microphones or you know, areas like that that can be expensive. Um, if you're if you are going to be producing um, uh, sort of more uh, brand videos, I suppose, um, and TV adverts, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's going to be expensive. But that, for me, that's a different area, right? Uh, for what we're talking about here, you know, blog writing, articles, podcasts, infographics, videos, all of that is, is as cheap or expensive as you want it to be, really. Um, you, know, you can hire great people who can, who can produce content. There are so many great copywriters. I know many of them. We use, we use many of them myself in my own company. So it's some fantastic copywriters out there who can produce content um, very cost effectively. Um, and as I say, recording a YouTube video is now very easy. Putting up a podcast is very easy. You know, these things are, are cheap and easy now. So, um, so you, know, you can scrimp on the spend quite a lot without compromising on the quality today. That wasn't really the case 10 years ago. You know, you did need to spend a, a bit of money then um, to, to make it decent. But nowadays you don't. Um, so I would encourage any organization who's looking at content and thinking ah, it's expensive, it's difficult, it's time consuming, just take a step back and, and rethink that because actually there are creative ways to do it really cheap without compromising that quality. And, and actually, a lot of the time, the audience appreciate it if it's just someone talking to them in conversational language in 30 seconds on a video and answering their question. That's a lot more valuable than a big five minute high production 
you know, exciting, expensive video that takes ages to answer the question. I just get on with it. I've got to, I, I need an answer. Give me the answer and move on, right? I'm, especially, especially wealthy people, right? Because they don't have time to mess around or they don't want to have time to mess around. They've got other things to do, right? So let's just answer the question and move on. So you know, a lot of the time, that's, that's, a, that's a great way to do it. In terms of ROI, um, you know, we come back to setting your goals, right? What are you actually trying to achieve? Now, now sometimes, sometimes you're a very heavily content-led business and getting the content out there itself is the goal, right? And therefore the ROI is is very difficult to measure because you're not really trying to acquire clients or, or get certain levels of engagement. You're just trying to produce content to build a, a, you know, a brand or, or establish the business in some way. So that's harder. But normally your content is is out there for a purpose. Um, so you can tie that through, um, through a number of different metrics. Obviously your content on social media, there are various um, analytics and insight platforms out there um, on the actual platforms themselves, although I know some of them are being retired at the moment, but um, on the actual platforms itself, but also on some of the social tools and the marketing automation tools where you can really understand who is engaging and which of those come through to visits and ultimately to leads. Um, again, I come back to LinkedIn lead generation. I don't want to bang on about it too much, but that's a great way of producing fantastic guides that people can download and those in exchange turn into leads and you can track those leads through your CRM system as to what turns into a sale. That's a very, very clear way of getting ROI, of course. Um, you're making sure you've got, got good call to actions and your content is steering people towards a phone number or a trackable link, ideally. Um, that in itself is also going to give you, you know, a lot of, of clear data on the content. But you're, you're never going to know everything, right? If you're producing a lot of content, you won't necessarily know how every single piece of content played its part in the journey. I mean, the, you can use an attribution model to understand how people move from social to organic to landing on your blog to convert on the page. You can you can track those journeys. And that's important that, that that's done. But you don't necessarily need to track every single piece of content. But right? if you're producing content, you are almost certainly going to be improving your SEO. You're almost certainly going to be improving your social situation. And you're almost certainly going to be getting in front of more eyes. As long as that's decent content, you've done your planning properly, um, then you know you will get people engaging with that, some of which you won't see. There's also areas like dark social, right, which sounds very scary. It's not like the dark web. So dark social, like when someone shares something through email, for example, and you can't track it, you lose, you lose sight of it. That sort of thing, if you can produce that content, put that out there, and it's, it's, it's almost certainly going to be shared in ways that you can't see as well. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of value in that that you can't necessarily track, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't produce it. And you know, it all, as with everything in marketing, it's, it's, you know, it's an integrated piece, right? It's all an ecosystem. Everything fits together. So if you are producing content, you need, it, need to give it time to get established and get engaged. And then you will see a lift over a period of time and you need to start to attribute how is that, how is that lift um, uh, attributed to to the, the work that we're doing and if you're producing a lot more content and you're getting a lot more visits a lot more le leads which is usually the case you can certainly attribute some, some value to it even if you can't directly track it through so 